Welcome to our third in our series of public lectures this semester on the theme of the upside of down. If you've been with us on previous weeks, then please notice that I have just put in the chat the link to the Richard Horton talk from a couple of weeks ago. Do feel free to share that with, uh, with others who missed it a fortnight ago. And of course, if you weren't here a fortnight ago, then that's your opportunity to watch it after tonight. But this evening, it's a, a, a wonderful thing that I've got a, a colleague from the philosophy department here to give us uh, a talk on a topic which is, uh, well, which is right on topic. Just before I get to her, let me remind you that our final public lecture is in a fortnight, once again, of course, same time, same place. Uh, and this will be a somewhat different format. It will be a panel discussion. Myself and a couple of colleagues from UEA, uh, Joe Clark and Nick Brooks, will be talking about adaptation. We'll be talking about the fact that the climate crisis and other aspects of the ecological emergency are here already and we need to adapt to them. And how can we adapt to them in a way that is positive, in a way that is transformative, rather, th rather than in a way that is maladaptive? That will be our topic, a forward-looking one, very vital, um, and we think a good way to finish the series. But before we get to that, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening my colleague, Dr. Sophie Scott-Brown. Sophie is a master of many trades, but one of her key areas of expertise is the politics and philosophy of education. She is coming to us this evening from the place where she lives, and that is almost off grid. I'm mentioning this partly to show that she walks her talk and partly to explain the reason why the lighting, as you'll see in a moment, for her, um, for her room, um, where she'll be speaking from, is, uh, is not the greatest. But the important thing, uh, obviously, is the quality of what she will say. And of that, uh, I have no doubt. Sophie's going to be speaking with us uh, about the education system and how the crisis that we're in may provide an opportunity for us to rethink what education is all about. It's an absolutely vital topic. And uh, I'm delighted to hand over to her for our public lecture this evening. Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupert, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. It is really lovely to kind of see so many people. Um, so just as a quick note, despite the advertised title, my main theme for today is education for real autonomy. Now, um, you may have heard of the campaign for real ale. Well, it's kind of a little bit like that, only probably less fun. A significant learning loss was the doleful conclusion of a recent EC report into the legacy of COVID for education and young people. The impact of the disruption, the authors continued, was likely to amount to a major and highly detrimental impact on the, de on the development of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. One British tabloid put the matter more succinctly. Generation stupid, they declared, leaving an entire cohort of students to add the shame of personal failure to the considerable trauma of the past year. Now, there is no denying that the pandemic has had a catastrophic effect on educational business as usual, but amidst the chaos have come a few positives, which as they don't lend themselves as readily to sensational headlines, receive less attention. Two Norwegian researchers, Sarah Bubb and Marianne Jones, conducted a survey on the effect of the pandemic on students aged 6 to 16, on their parents and their teachers, covering the move to online delivery and homeschooling during the first lockdown period. Their sample group was large and mixed, covering different geographic areas and social groups. Their report, without flinching from the difficulties, acknowledged an important the experience have promoted an increase in student autonomy. They judge this by asking students to rate their confidence in using digital tools and tackling tasks independently, which they then compared to the ratings assigned to them by their parents and their teachers to the same questions, based on their observations of the students and their children at work. The results showed a clear trend towards a relatively high and increased level of confidence. Now, this is certainly more cheerful news, 
although some caveats must be taken into account. Barb and Jones focused their definition of student autonomy on increased capacity to use digital tools and on their motivation to undertake set tasks with either minimal or comparatively informal supervision. Now, these are important factors, but nevertheless, as I shall discuss later, they constitute a relatively weak definition of autonomy. Moreover, the research took place in Norway, which in true Scandinavian tradition tends to adopt and implement progressive methods of education more readily than we do in the UK. Finally, the exact social breakdown of their sample was unclear. Another factor the crisis has revealed here in the UK is the very real impact of material poverty on education. Children with limited access to adequate digital technology, parents simply unable to commit the time required. Nevertheless, in this talk, I wish to build on the idea that recent events have put education and autonomy in the spotlight. I will first define autonomy, examine its application in prevailing educational thought, and consider the shortcomings of this. I will then offer an alternative application, which I argue not only better fulfills the concept, but will become increasingly more relevant as we move into a future likely to be characterized by change, uncertainty, and instability. And I'll conclude by briefly describing some further insights arising from the experience of the pandemic, which we may be able to take forwards towards achieving this end. Just before going on though, I do want to state that none of what I say is intended in any way as an attack or criticism on parents, carers and others who have been struggling on and through an immensely difficult situation. This is meant solely as a positive contribution to say that even in the toughest of times, there are still seeds beneath the snow. Okay, so the case for real autonomy. First of all, what is autonomy? At a basic level, autonomy means simply self-government, an individual's capacity to direct their, their actions unaided and uncoerced. This seems straightforward enough, and in many respects, it is only the goal of growing from vulnerable dependent infancy into independent maturity. But whilst this is, to varying degrees, a natural capacity, it requires cultivation and development to make it fully operative. So in other words, education. Education then, in all its many splendid forms, is vital to how we grow up and how we grow into ourselves and into the world. But what does this mean in practice and how should it be done? So in 2008, after 15 years of research, or hard yakka in the local lingo, Australian educationalist John Hattie published his meta-analysis of over 800 educational studies, the ultimate literature review, from which he identified metacognition as the primary factor in successful learning. By this, he meant an individual's consciousness about learning as opposed to what was being learned and the application of this consciousness into self-regulation. In other words, an individual's ability to identify an ideal and to judge their own process towards realizing it. Surely, this is the quintessential definition of autonomous learning. Well, I would say yes and no. What this really describes is how someone becomes a proficient operator within a defined system. Even if they do not yet know particular answers, or are yet to get across the whole content of the subject, they understand something of the mechanisms required to reach them. The more proficient they become at understanding the system they are working within, the less teaching they require, the less coercion. So in that sense, yes, autonomous. Even without the benefit of reading 800 plus studies, this makes intuitive sense because it outlines how someone becomes aware of themselves as an individual actor within a formal context, gradually increasing their capacity to do more and more as they master and manage a dialogue between the received concepts and the technical skills required to actualize them. This is not unique to academic subjects like maths, languages, the sciences, and so on. It is equally applicable in arts or sports and forms the basis of a familiar apprenticeship model of learning. And yet, whilst important, this can only be a partial definition of autonomy because the priority stress remains reproductive. One enters relatively stable systems and learns their internal mechanics. 
First, the basic moves. So grammar and vocab in a, in a language, functions in maths, rules in a game, techniques in a craft. When more advanced, one grapples with the less tangible, more discursive spaces such systems occupy within a culture. The silent force fields that direct the flow and shape of information. What is taken for granted? What can be said and done? What cannot? The learner starts with these basic moves and advances through levels of increasing complexity and mastery. But what happens when those systems become inadequate for describing or organising lived experience? Or if they simply prove illusional, when, in short, the accepted rules, structures and processes are no longer fit for purpose? We are currently experiencing elements of this sort of breakdown on several levels. The pandemic has exposed, or perhaps reinforced is a better word, incoherencies in our political system, manifest in the bungled and delayed decision making, the frustration of regional and local authorities prevented from acting quickly to respond to the specific contingencies on their own patches. It has further illuminated the fundamental inequities in our society, just how many people, for example, are living precariously paycheck to paycheck reliant on a gig economy that simply collapsed under the stress. Then there are the recent social movements such as Me Too or Black Lives Matter, which have exposed the omissions and silences buried deep in our collective culture and social structures. Added to all this, and in some respects, perhaps even outstripping them all, climate change has and will continue to give a whole new meaning to the very concepts of system, from its inner core to its outer mantle. In the view I discussed earlier, education for autonomy largely equated to an individual mastering the moves required to achieve certain desired ends. Now, the reason this can only ever be partial is because it depends on those ends remaining relatively fixed, eternal verities instead of the provisional products of ideology and history. As self-governance goes, it's weak much like the sort of self-governance the British government used to apply to the colonies when they realised it was cheaper and actually more profitable if they coerced themselves. Full autonomy, by contrast, must mean an active role in constructing the conditions that produce desires and ends in the first place. Now, this may sound like the culturally familiar idea of the self-creating individual, which echoes down to us from a romantic tradition that tended to privilege the notion of the free person inscribing their will upon a pliant world. Now, this would be fine if it were true, but our worlds are inescapably social in the broadest possible sense and creating them always a collective social activity. It is helpful then to start by rejecting the traditional idea of the individual as an isolated, contained bundle of wants and capacities. We are completely entangled with this world, whether we would or no, and it makes little sense to pretend otherwise. The really autonomous person, then, is alert and receptive to this state of affairs, a fully present social being. Independence here is not about denying or escaping our interrelationships, but claiming responsibility for them. As such, Education for real autonomy is also a political education as well as a politicised one. Because herein lies the difference between a democratic system where people are effectively reduced to booing or cheering every few years via a mass vote and a democracy where people are meaningfully involved in co-creating their social worlds. So what are the educational implications of this? What sort of curriculum would this require? Well, arguably, this is the wrong question to ask. Whilst knowledge in terms of data, facts, information would all remain important, you cannot expect to act sensibly, let alone effectively in this world without them. They would, by necessity, move position. From being ends or artefacts, where they are at present, towards being tools. Put another way, process and product change places in terms of priorities which means that it is better to start by asking what sorts of skills and attributes do socially adept people often demonstrate? To this, there are many possible answers. Flexibility springs to mind, as does imagination and resourcefulness. 
but above all, they have a certain poise of mind, which can balance concessions with self-possession, a sense of when to give and when to hold the line. How do you translate a poise into a practice? In another inheritance from the romantic strain in progressive thinking, educators have often championed the arts as guarantors of the sort of confident, creative and socially integrated person that I'm idealizing. I don't believe that any one subject or set of them offers any such guarantees. It is perfectly possible for an individual to be stymied by prescriptive arts-based education but find their minds opened by a liberational maths-based one. That said, the reason thinkers have often turned to the arts is that, in theory at least, the thinking process involved in them rehearses some of the key cognitive and emotional processes that I'm arguing form the basis for real autonomy. Firstly, they generate and sustain a dialogue between ideas and materials, prompting an awareness of oneself as a creative agent but one that is subject to restraints. Secondly, they encourage a receptiveness to novel forms of association beyond what is common or culturally assumed to link together. Thirdly, when integrated, the sum of their parts yields a new unity through which fresh perceptions of or on the world are made possible. Finally, and equally important, perhaps most important of all, is the fact that all art ultimately fails. All artists know how provisional that unity they've achieved is and just how negotiated it is. Creativity is never finished, never free from compromise, never fully transcendent, and nor would we wish it to be. Its very imperfection is what yields future possibilities. And the future we are moving into will urgently require such possibilities such flexible skills and malleable states of mind. It will demand from us a far greater dispersal of intellectual ability and political responsibility. Climate change will affect everyone, but affect everyone differently. For all that we can learn to prepare ourselves, the future will yet have an improvisational quality. The only logical, plausible way to handle this effectively will be to dramatically increase the power of communities to respond to the specific conditions generated within local contexts, to create multiple sections of action, centres of action, linked together in a nimble, vociferous network of association. Wonderful, sounds good, but how far are we now in our current system from preparing people for something like this? There are even now, even now, arts in the schools. Schools are also often the loci for facilitating other extracurricular opportunities. Again, however, this misses the point, which is about creating an overall culture where learning is never simply an external object, a goal against which progress can be measured, but a deep texturing of daily experience. I believe that in these terms, we could not be further from this ideal. And I shall draw now from my own experience teaching in higher education to illustrate what I mean. So first year students arrive to us having one way or another cobbled together the correct letters of the alphabet required to pass through our admissions hoops. They are then supposedly members of a privileged elite, but frankly, we often find them in a state of semi-trauma, often quite literally stunned very unsure of themselves to the point of being almost excessively needy, requiring constant detailed reassurance about what to do and how to do it. Almost never am I asked why they've been asked to do something, only ever how and more to the point exactly how. Above all, they are terrified about grades and panic makes for forcefulness. The question I am most commonly asked, and I know that several of my colleagues will concur, is what do I have to do to get a good grade? Now, I, I don't know what to say to this. I don't really want to say anything, but I have to, because in some respects, they're right. Because the performative culture sadly now institutionalized into the school system does extend into higher education. In fact, those very admission systems I mentioned operate as guarantors that this culture has been so thoroughly assimilated that coercion, which is labor intensive, will no longer be necessary. 
Suitable students will accept, obey and deliver, sparing their lecturers from the distasteful displays of asserting explicit discipline. We too have our curricula, devised this time to the individual tastes and preferences of lecturers, the authority to do so having been conferred by status and title, conveniently obscuring the reality that a PhD is really a very long essay setting out one take on a very specific topic. So unless lecturers teach on this and this alone, and some do, um, then we too are in the position of an intelligent layperson. But we don't show it. Moreover, we teach as we were taught. Only now we are in the driving seat and can have our fun in choosing the themes, readings and tasks. We judge the results with an often fairly nominal reference to a generic rubric of standards provided by the university, but more often according to our own notions of good and bad, which again replicate what we were exposed to ourselves. In many respects, the whole exercise resembles a sort of intellectual dressage. The stranger, more, more artificial the manoeuvre students are able to make, the more they prove to us that they have aligned with our pattern. The higher the grade, we feel inclined to reward them. Rather beautifully, they are then told that this is the product they should expect. That if they are not getting this, then they are not, if they are not getting all this expertise pumped through to them, this knowledge presented to them for easy digestion, they're not learning. They're being conned out of their very substantial student tuition fees. Now, this is not to say that what is offered on university level courses and modules is somehow invalid or uninteresting or unimportant. Far from it. As I said before, education for autonomy does not come down to some species of subject chauvinism, nor even preference for one teaching method over another. The problem is that no matter how thorough, detailed, well intentioned we as lecturers continually reinforce even unintentionally, the idea that there is a truth and a right and a wrong means of displaying it. We do this rather than opening up access to many possible truths or many possible pathways towards them. We maintain the illusion by concealing our presence, concealing our decision making, our uncertainties, presenting only a confident fait accompli to students, which in doing so always decontextualizes the subject matter from their lives and disconnects it from the wider world that they are supposed to be preparing to go into. So, as thoughts turn tentatively to pathways out of this current crisis, and look dubiously towards the next one on the horizon, we need to, um, the next one we need to deal with, has the experience given us anything further that we can claim for and use in the cause of education for real autonomy? Now, I suggest there are two interesting factors we might attempt to develop. The first, though I'm not sure I'm gonna be thanked for saying this, is that many parents have become far more aware of what their, what their children are doing education-wise, and by extension of what teaching is, and of themselves as teachers. Now, yes, I do believe that anyone can teach. I think that some people do this far better than others, and some people certainly enjoy it far more than others, but the basic process of introducing someone to something that we know about, but that is unknown or unfamiliar to them, is not the prerogative of a select, of a select few. As a side effect of compulsory schooling and professionalization, many now automatically defer teaching to others, the professionals, assuming themselves to be incapable or incompetent. This has had a damaging effect, not least in that when a situation like this occurs, there's just no backup system in place. Historically, parents, the family, the community, everyone stuck their oar into telling a young person something about the world. Now, this wasn't always great stuff, nor did it always deploy especially enlightened methods. But the sense of education as a collective responsibility and endeavor was useful. In terms of cultivating real autonomy, extended networks like this are invaluable. Not only do they provide a profusion of perspectives on the world, but these emerge in context, showing how knowledge works in and through everyday situations. Second, if we change the question from what young people did not do during lockdown to what they did do, 
another set of possibilities presents itself. Despite the horrified reports that young people did only on average two and a half hours of schoolwork a day, as much as that, goodness, they did not enter into a state of suspended animation for the rest of the time. They did things, perhaps not the things educators would have them do, but what they chose to do willingly is instructive. For example, unsurprisingly, for many young people, especially teenagers, lockdown periods involved huge quantities of time socialising online. And this has been partly reflected by a rising number of YouTube, Instagram and other social media uploads. Online content created and published by young people. Now, these are, of course, of variable quality, but they're constructive nonetheless. Then, of course, there are video games. My nephew has now completed hitherto unknown levels on a multiplayer internet-based soccer game. Now, the game itself aligns with the sort of learning model I outlined earlier. You learn the basic moves, then you learn harder ones and gradually move up the stages. What is more interesting, however, is that he plays with people from around the world who he argues with ferociously on a headset. He's acquired for himself a comparative anthropology of gaming that is not part of the formal game, but that he puts to good use all the same. For someone who just won't do even the most basic of school tasks willingly, he can teach you chapter and verse about the soccer tactics favoured by different nationalities. If, of course, you let him. For many children, there has simply been more hanging around, which is not always a bad or even an unproductive thing. Often this has involved more direct interaction with adults or older siblings, quite a few of whom, referring to my previous point, turn teacher themselves. In some cases, just the simple increase in sustained attention mattered. Free-flowing conversation on any topic, as opposed to the controlled and heavily directed classroom variety, requires concentration, connection, attention, and an ability to improvise. Now, once again, it is important to acknowledge that for some children, the picture painted here just does not apply. For some, schools are vital resource centres for even the most basic things, food and heat, let alone technology, or their refuges from unsafe homes. There can be no flinching from the fact that in these instances, bright sides are not so forthcoming. And yet for a thankfully large proportion of young people across this country, at least, elements of what I describe have been the case. So from all this, I suggest we extract the following insights. Education should involve and recognise an ensemble cast of people inside and out of the school in a range of different capacities. Not only does this share out the responsibility, it is simply more interesting for students and quite odd, really, to think that one person or even a handful of people, no matter how well trained, can provide as rich, full and varied an education as a whole community or an extended network can offer. Education is also about space. We need to resist the culture of accounting for every moment, which I fear will now be ever more intensified in what is likely to become a mania for catching up. There is real value in doing some teaching by not teaching, by unplanning some lessons and letting students start the conversation listening to where it goes and not being too worried if it doesn't go anywhere near a preordained learning objective. Not for all lessons, just more lessons. Because being taken seriously, being considered interesting, is really the very basis of being, full stop. In the past 12 months, and as I speak, we near the anniversary of lockdown one, which was the 16th of March, 2020, we have been through hellish times, not just as a society, but as an entire species. It would be flippant not to acknowledge this. There is a point where keeping calm and carrying on can be almost callous. And yet the disruption to normality has provided a unique perspective on that normality, and it is vital that we use it. Our vulnerability, our humanness has been thrown into stark relief, but far from making us weak, understanding that fragility and interdependence may yet save us in the long run. The universal compulsory school system that the EC report I quoted was lamenting, and the higher education system of which I spoke 
were both product are, are both products of the industrial age. Factories for producing the workers needed for the factories, some for the floor, some for the offices, which meant that division, stratification among students across subjects was all the order of the day. Not only is that particular phase of our past over, but the legacy of it now presents us with the greatest collective challenge in human history. The ways in which traditional schooling has taught us to think make the reality of climate change difficult for us to even conceive, let alone deal with effectively. It is not something that will be neatly and finally resolved in a single momentous conference declaration or piece of government policy. Even if we restore some balance in time, maintaining that balance will always be dynamic, will always involve multiple shifting factors in constant states of flux, adaptation, compromise, and it will require everyone. No one can wait to be saved. And why would they want to be? The more responsibility we take, the more we claim back the shape and direction of our own lives. A difficult future need not mean a terrible one. It may even, spiritually speaking, be a richer one. Thank you. Sophie, thank you. That was, fab that was fantastic, as I knew it would be. Um, well done. You've given us rich, rich food for thought there, and you've spoken very directly to uh, our topic. You've been um, unabashed in pointing out some deep problems and putting forward some radical solutions. And you've also um, drawn attention to some of the ways in which the difficult situation we're in right now provides us with some real opportunities. So let me open up the discussion by following up one or two of those threads with you. And meanwhile, inviting our audience here to start putting their thoughts or questions into the, the chat and then we'll come to them uh, in due course. So let me start out with what you said about autonomy in relation to being um, social, uh, which I was very struck by and uh, very much in agreement with. You and I have been talking about this mm -hmm. uh, um, before tonight uh, and it, it's such a fascinating and important topic because it seems to me this is an area where philosophy really has something to contribute because what people are sort of inclined superficially to think is that autonomy must mean some kind of libertarian fantasized sort of atomized independence from everybody else, uh, a sort of breaking away from society. Whereas you said in your lecture, you said real autonomy is being a social being. That's almost a, a quote from, from what you said, which I thought was, was really, be good and really strong. Um, I don't know if you if you might want to elaborate on that uh, mm -hmm. a, a little bit. Uh, how do you see the way in which this works? What would you say to someone who said, "Well, that sounds like a, a paradox or a contradiction"? Sure. Well, again, it comes back to this sort of um, notion of of self government, and and I think mm. uh, so. What's really important there is this idea of okay well if you're if you're i mean what the distinction i was trying to bring out in my talk is that you know okay you can be a contained individual that's functioning and doing things uncoerced and unaided but you're not really producing the conditions in which those wants and desires that you're supposedly aiming for you know are even constituted um to me autonomy means take you know a sort of full sense of social being because the world we live in is social um and the sort of everything across from our you know kind of economic lives our political lives they constantly involve interactions transactions with one another and more importantly and I think speaking to the sort of particularly with the climate change situation in mind recognizing that this doesn't just stop at the human that this is a full kind of involvement in sort of life in the broadest possible sense so if you're going to be truly autonomous then somehow kind of ignoring that or bracketing that and just you know sort of um performing functions as it were doesn't actually give you that you know full grasp over your life it's like i said it's it's practically ignoring um the kind of sort of truth of your sense the truth of your own lived experiences 
So autonomy really is, is a sort of, is a kind of grasping of responsibility for, you know, it's a sort of coming to terms with that socialness of being and actually becoming, and so, because if you don't come to terms with it, it will happen to you rather than with you, mm -hmm. right? And I think we've talked before, Rupert, about, and you had a particularly nice phrase that I really liked about the idea that, um, you know, autonomy is, is, is actually about avoiding capture by other people's ideologies. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to live inside someone else's particular view of um, how the world should be structured or ordered, that actually you sort of, you, you recognize that you can be a full contributing participatory part of that. Mm. um so yeah i sort of that that's you know why i kind of reframe yeah. this notion of autonomy um somewhat and i see it far more as a kind of accepting of responsibility and not an evasion of interrelationship but an mm. embrace of it it's like showing mm. up for your life really like mm. really mm. kind of being present for those relationships and interactions um having a kind of frank honesty about it and not letting it be done to you yeah no that's really nice uh, and uh, the phrase self-government that you use there uh, a very resonant phrase in in the history of philosophy we might think about um ralph waldo emerson we might think about uh, gandhi from whom i learned the most about this in his uh, in his great uh, pamphlet hidden swaraj where he argues that um that the Indian quest for self-rule is not going to achieve anything unless uh, Indians, Indian people, uh, attain to a certain kind of rule over themselves as well. Uh, and they seek to, to do that, obviously, um, together. And yeah, I couldn't agree more that, um, that intellectual autonomy has to be about uh, an ability to think uh, and to think outside the norm and to think outside the normal, which is absolutely vital when we're in a situation where we have uh, a society whose ordinary ways of thinking are, well, frankly, dooming us. So how do we then um, put this together mm. with, the, um, with the endeavor to escape the, the skiller of uh, of conformism and the caribidis of, if that's the right pronunciation, uh, of um, a sort of uh, glorious uh, isolation, uh, the sort of the sort of libertarian ideal. How do we find? How do we make this kind of this kind of middle ground, if that's the right phrase? And mm -hmm. and and do you have thoughts about how this can be done uh, best in the in the situation of uh, of education? where there are inevitably some kind of hierarchies and, and inequalities between the, the teachers and the taught? Mm -hmm. Sure. No, it's a, it's a great question. Now, the sort of approach I wanted to take and sort of really emphasise here is that um, I sort of, I think it's very, it's all very well and good for me to sit here in a, in a nice evening with you good people and, and have a nice chat about how the world could be. But um, the reality is we have this system and for all the sort of best and most progressive thinking in the world it's not going to suddenly magically um, disappear so my approach has always been to sort of say well firstly I am an optimist and I think no matter how kind of brutal um, the sort of what I would call the political principle is like the um, imposition or the inscription of power onto our social structure social systems it never quite manages to destroy the social principle. And that is the kind of relationships that human beings contract between each other voluntarily, that kind of sort of sense of voluntary association, mutual aid, self-help. We bring that with us. It's, it's small. It's often very weak. It's often very hugely over-dominated by the political principle. But nevertheless, I still think at the end of the day, you know, you could strip a lot of this aside and you can say we are human beings. We have mm. we have we don't have perfect or total agency. Um, I think we're sort of happily past the days of, you know, kind of unreflective utopian thinking now. So now it's about 
finding those small cracks and spaces where things that are positive are happening. And um, it's less about kind of reinventing the wheel than trying to just encourage those tendencies where we already find them. Now, I always feel a little bit worried when I come and talk about sort of education, because actually I'm fully well aware that some incred incredible teachers um, out there who are probably sort of could tell me far more about, you know, just how difficult the system they have to work in is and are still somehow managing to do incredible things with young people that gives young people voice, gives them space, lets them experiment, lets them fail without it being too traumatic. And that these teachers are sort of working overtime to um, to kind of create those little nooks and crannies and spaces within the system. So I think one of the first things I'd say is, you know, I'm not really interested in reinventing the wheel so much as I'm really interested in, you know, supporting the positive things that are already going on. The other sort of factor I wanted to put across in this talk was actually there are some really small and simple moves that we can make. So, for example, all right, there's probably not a parent in the country right now that even wants to think about homeschooling again. But if everyone, you know, everyone that was involved in that took away this sense that it's absolutely right, that they should be more involved, that they should be part of this, that they're they're not this, you know, it doesn't all have to be deferred to the school, that you can have a home culture where everything's open for discussion or, you know, it's a sort of um, it's a kind of lively, dynamic, like school doesn't just finish at the school gates, which doesn't mean you then have to lecture or, you know, sort of. Um, teach your children every evening but even just that sense of well you know I'm involved in this too I can be a part of this and even very simple things like just simply having conversations with young people it matters it does matter because they're actually the elements that are increasingly squeezed out of the school day and I worry are going to be increasingly more so as the sort of government kind of leans and puts pressure on schools to catch up Mm. um so there's you know that's that's a sort of another space that we can work with um if I was to be more um more kind of assertive in what I would like to see and especially maybe thinking in um kind of higher education settings I actually would very much support things like um the removal of grading from from sort of degree programs but actually also from the examination system because grading is for me in my view um the one of the most fundamentally toxic mechanisms that really do kind of cultivate this performative culture it doesn't lead to better learning per se grading is not the same as testing um grading is not the same as competition it is pure, it is a sort of and you know when you're on the inside of that process to a degree you know that there is a large sense of arbitrariness about it and it's you know to use an old fashioned term from educational sociology it really is a labeling process and it's and it has incredibly deleterious effect um however i appreciate that that's probably not going to be rolled out anytime soon so in the meantime yeah my strategy here would be to say where are the spaces we can that that are where are the places that young people are getting to breathe and how can we best support them super let's start going to our audience here so Daryl Hall Daryl has a, a question following up this thread about autonomy and freedom <laughs> Yes, I'd just like to say, please become education minister, because I don't agree with grading. I think it's labelling too, by the way. But the question was, so autonomy in this sense, it's about mental freedom, because we, we essentially, I think, people don't feel free in our society today. I think it's pretty much we're organised from the cradle to the grave in some extent. And everything. I certainly feel that I'm at present doing a mature student degree in the first year. And this really hits home with me because on our, it's a small group, it's at City College, there's only 16 of us. And on that group, there is a constant fretting about the grading process and about how that is the most important thing and about how that is what it all applies to. And, and at my age, at 50 something, I actually am doing it to learn for learning's sake. Yet at the same time, I have to hit these grades and I have to pass when really, the assignment should be about showing my understanding and I'm grasping the concepts. Yeah, I'm still feeling the same pressure, even though I'm not planning to use it very much in a vocational way. So I just wondered 
any and what you think about that really no it's a, it's a great point and i couldn't agree more i mean even in sort of my life span from when i was an undergraduate at university i mean like you know sort of that kind of that culture is just seeped in more and more and more and the fact that you know it sort of gets blisteringly complicated after a while and you get all these you know sort of staggering eye popping rubrics about well if you you'll get 10 points if you do this but it'll be minus five and a half points if you do that and you know on this category you need to do this you need to do this I actually you know I think sort of I have incredible admiration for students who somehow who even bloody well understand it frankly because I've got generally speaking got no idea um to me grading's kind of I mean it's weird because straight away it's instilling and inscribing that hierarchy straight away it's the ranking and the stratification it's got a no educational um study and perhaps I'd be happy to be told otherwise but I've never seen anyone that convincingly proves a correlation between grading and learning um, and again I distinguish between testing because it's one thing to do it like a, a test which is like a temperature check did you get it did you not get it you know that's fine um, grading that's a different thing to me there's something okay so it's a sort of strange combination between hierarchizing if that's a word and infantilizing it's kind of babyish because like you're saying Daryl that's you know kind of when you're living your life and you just need to understand things and apply them you know you don't you don't need to you know you don't sort of don't get grades on your parenting or you don't get grades on you know how you manage your day or <laughs> whatever so there is something slightly odd and just very surreal and decontextualized from life about it which um i think is is a kind of problem problematic and it's reinforcing this this culture and it is completely pervasive now so you keep asking yourself well where the heck are these sort of spaces i can go to i mean and the effect it's had on education is particularly shocking and I think is particularly accelerated in the past few years. Um, however, of course, I suppose in true optimistic um, style and as a historian primarily by by training, um, I'm sort of very aware that in some ways, do we ever really expect institutional educational in, um, you know, forms of education to really be where we do all our most meaningful learning. Some of the kind of richest, the, the radical traditions was pretty much entirely fueled through um, autodidactic culture. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of the informal mutual aid self-help groups that gathered together. And, you know, we think and we're sort of customs to thinking that they've died a death now they've died out actually with the internet and the online world i'd say they've sort of mushroomed and quadrupled um which i think is very interesting development so yeah um i'm not sure i'm sort of really satisfyingly kind of addressing your point other than really just empathizing very strongly and concurring um but equally just sort of saying i suppose the mental freedom aspect it's actually, you know, one of the tricks is just to condition yourselves to kind of look around you to be opportunistic in your thinking, you know, okay, so where can I find these spaces? Um, where can I find, you know, that sort of those connections that that kind of satisfying learning experience I want? Yeah. So. Rupert, Wait. I don't know if you want to move on to different questions. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good answer. Thanks, Sophie. We'll follow up the same theme. We'll come to uh, Fee Roxborough, who wants to talk about uh, grading uh, as well. Fee. Hello. Hi, Sophie. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, you're getting a cat in the background as well. Um, I loved all of that, and we've talked about this before. Um, I just, What particularly stuck in my head was... Um, you say how we disguise ourselves, uh, you know, we disguise our own position coming to lecturing and teaching. Um, and uh, um, I love your picture of autonomy as ultimately, ultimately being a sort of collective practice. Um, it's, it's about collective care and socialisation. Absolutely love that. Um, so sort of continuing on the theme of grading, I often have the same feeling that I would, I would love to be able to do away with grades and I often want to kind of veer students away from thinking that they should measure their identity 
or their worth or their mm. value of any sort in terms of grades. It's so hard to do that whilst also steering them in a graded system. So I wanted to kind of ask a kind of double barrel question, really. Like, what do you see? I, I like to emphasize on, okay, let's look at what we can emphasize that's positive rather than going, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. What's the best thing we can encourage, encourage ourselves to do as lecturers, which might help us work around that kind of grading paradox? And what can we do to help encourage ourselves to remember our positionality and sort of give back some of the students' voice in doing so? Mm -hmm. No, it's a great question. And there's a sort of few, so I've been thinking about this quite a lot because, you know, for all my for all my um aspirations and hopes you know even if we even if we manage to get you know our head of department on board you know uea as an institution is not suddenly going to go well, let's not do grading anymore however i would say that last year in um you know i we dropped we did drop grading or we dropped formal grading for the first years um which was very interesting and actually i'd like to sort of um, hear more about that and whether you know because initially there was actually some resistance from students because there is this sort of um, I would say kind of myth that you know if you don't get grading then the barbarians are in at the gate and cool quality goes out the window and how will I ever distinguish or differentiate myself just in case there are any students um, sort of listening or in fact anybody um, you know, you don't actually lose individuality if you lose grading. You you don't, because actually what then happens is people have to take you as an individual more seriously. They have to listen to what you're saying, how you present yourself, what you're actually doing. And numbers lazy, numbers easy. You just glance at something and it's OK, fair enough. And you don't inquire any more into that person. So, um, yeah, so sorry, that's a slight digression. But that was an interesting thing that happened. And it wasn't planned. And it was because of the pandemic. Um, Rupert is a is a man, not a number. Excellent. Um, but that would be interesting to see. And maybe that is something that would be more feasible. Like, could we actually say, all right, well, in first year university, none of what you do kind of goes towards your final outcome anyway. So possibly we could try not grading for the first year. That might be a campaign that had actually more traction. Um, however, you know, in terms of how do you deal within this grading system, I, I know this is a slightly odd answer, but one of the things I do is I'm, I'm I think, and I think you are the same, very frank about it. You know, we have, have frank discussions with the students um, about the process, about my decision making process in it. I know some of our colleagues do um, the same. Probably we spend so much time kind of apologizing almost for the fact we have to do this and this is how we're going to do it. And the students are sitting there just get on with it. Um, I use a lot of humor actually to try and actually dispel some of that because what really worries me is the fear that comes with it. And I think that's really crippling and that's what really restricts people from experimenting so many students I know would rather play it safe because they're just like oh well you know if I do that it goes wrong and I get a bad grade and so I sort of the other thing I do is um so in I have I arrange my assessments so that um they're kind of 50 50 one half of it I say is a is complete you know experiment I'm not actually going to grade that it's you know you create it you, you sort of have a play with it I will grade your reflective essay where you write about your thinking process and you and then I actually get them to grade themselves <laughs> I get them to assess their own um kind of thinking or their thought experiment or their artifact whatever it was they produced um so I try and find whatever way possible to give them back some power over the situation but yeah in the current kind of um climate it is really hard and you have to be so creative in how you approach that thanks fee okay the next question is from davide ritzer davide wants to ask something about how we overcome obstacles to the autonomy you're talking about davide yeah Thank you, Rupert, and thanks, Sophie, for a, a very, very interesting and I thought illuminating talk as well. 
Um, I think I'll slightly rephrase my question it, because in light of what you just said, it's probably going to be a question about uh, marginal practices and their possible impact or effect as external pressures on, on institutions. On a very small scale, we sometimes run reading groups in higher education, and sometimes we run them as um, um, upon the request of students. And there may be even cases, maybe not all the time, but there are, I have been in cases where I did not know the subject of the reading group better than the students, and we were coming together to learn it. And I wonder if these kind of practices, which at the moment are at the margin, you think might be perhaps organized together with others, be sort of um, able to send the institution a message that there is a point beyond which institutional organization in a way uh, fights against uh, its original goal to facilitate certain possibilities and it becomes so entrenched in its ways and it, it begins to become an obstacle. And I wonder if you think that these kind of small activities can help uh, um, promote a transformation to some extent. So just your thoughts around this. Mm. Oh, gosh. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question because on the one hand, I mean, it's the one sort of, it's a completely fair question too, because on the one hand, what I'm saying is, you know, sort of these sort of marginal practices or these small groups, what I call the social principle if you like you know the voluntary association the kind of sort of spontaneous they're all wonderful they're the exact spirit we want we want to see it bigger we want to grow it however by the definition they are marginal and you've always got that catch 22 okay so if you try to scale this up structure it organize it turn it into a sort of alternative scheme um then you are then you are sort of becoming what you then don't want to be um, so there's that element. And um, to be honest, I, I personally, I have not managed to resolve this fully in my mind, other than saying that you kind of, um, you, you almost just sort of want to kind of, I mean, I, I try, I try and support wherever possible, you know, in the hopes that, you know, kind of as marginal as it feels, um, the sort of it matters to the people who are who are taking part and maybe they take that memory with them and if they at least take the memory that it is possible that other ways are possible that that is sort of something in terms of how this then translates into um, into big institutional um, change well I suppose all you can hope again you've always got to think in the seriously long term that you know gradually you just slowly incrementally create a culture where actually more and more students just actually do start going well why why do I have to do that um, in the current climate that's amazingly difficult I mean in some ways one of the problems we're facing at the moment is that you know we're I mean, for us as lecturers, we're getting such, you know, the impact falls on us too. And the administrative loading is actually, I don't know, I mean, it does erode my enthusiasm to do all those extra things, to, to go to those reading groups, to take on extra work when I'm already at complete capacity, you know. So that's one way they do it. <laughs> um you know, and the second way is also the effect on the students that, you know, sometimes your, you know, students are so overwhelmed with all the kind of fairly baroque tasks they're being asked to do that they too don't really have the energy or the motivation or, or the confidence anymore to, to go along um, to, a, to a sort of extra reading group or, or something like that. Oh, so it's really, really hard. And again, I sort of fall back on just sort of saying, well, if you continually, you just sort of stoically almost have to keep that presence of there is a different way, there is an alternative. Um, I suppose, again, it's, hu you know, humour is actually really important to me. I want, to, I think what's so, so toxic is this culture of totality, is this culture of fear, is this is this and it builds it it cuts people off from one another and it makes people feel that this is the only way things can ever be and that if they want to survive they have to play ball and if at least you have some memories of people just going no it's not you know sort of you you can do it you know there there are other ways it sounds um it sounds very small it's certainly a very gradualist evolutionist type approach um i have faith that if it sufficiently resonates with enough people, hopefully they'll take something of that spirit forward. 
Thanks, that, that, that's very helpful. I, I just wanted to point out that I think one of the other adversities we face probably is that people coming together in the university in particular, but I suppose that would be true of other um, forms of uh, organized education, often have very different trainings. So for example, we have to talk to people who are trained to run a business enterprise and it is difficult to find a common ground there. But that's, that's yeah. Although, you know, sort of there's lots of, you know, I mean, there's something to be said for the entrepreneurial spirit, if you can possibly make in some sort of an appeal to that and then kind of steer it away from the sort of entirely cynical aspect of that. But yeah, no, I didn't say it was going to be easy. David. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, David. Let me follow this up for a second and then we'll come to Jeff Hinchcliffe's question. Mm. So you said in your, a little bit earlier, Sophie, you said, um, why don't we remove grading? You said grading. You, you said, let's not remove competition, but let's remove grading. My thinking is kind of the other way around, actually. Uh, I'm not sure that grading is that harmful in itself. Um, and uh, I'm not sure it would be very easy at all to remove it, as you've implied. But it seems to me that we could do something which might be a lot more radical by trying to really reduce the amount of competition that there is. How would we do that? Well, one of the key ways we could do that um, is by uh, making education um, much less stratified by uh, age uh, and trying to make education a lot more like, and you kind of implied this in your talk, a lot more like what it's actually like in real organic communities, which is basically uh, uh, adults uh, bring lots of adults bringing up children and children bringing up each other. Uh, so what we give our, our um, students at university, just like at school, um, is a lot of experience of uh, competing with um, students their own age um, and very little of, uh, of helping students who are either their own age or, and in some ways this is more important, uh, not their own age. What if we tried, this, 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 this seems to me would be a really radical change, but possibly a more achievable one. What if we really try to build into education a lot more um, the practice of uh, mitch, mixed age groups, mm -hmm. where the idea would be, and you could do this at uni as well, mm -hmm. where the idea would be uh, students, uh, school students and uni students helping um, other students. So that was a big part of the educational process. And might that drastically reduce the, the sense of competition, and then even if you kept grades, um, they would be um, much less uh, damaging. What do you mm -hmm. think? No, um, I'm stubbornly digging my heels in on the grading thing, <laughs> but, but I think the competition that there's no, I mean, when I say competition, I suppose I actually meant that, you know, the kind of silly fun ones, you have like kind of almost sports type ones that, you know, I sort of, because I, I was a bit worried that I was sounding a little bit like Oliver Cromwell and like I was going to ban fun and it was all going to be terribly worthy. Um, brown rice and vegetables and I didn't mean I didn't mean that we can still have we can still have sports but um what I I think that the sort of the more you're talking and I think it's a really really important point you're talking about that more insipid totally instructed you know embedded competition that's you know kind of totally sort of seeped into the very fabric of what we're sort of doing in education we're constantly at exactly as you said creating this incredibly artificial atmosphere where you know all the same all young people of the same sort of ages for the most part are kind of crammed in together and yeah kind of almost left to kind of thrash it out in a sort of vaguely lord of the flies type way although not quite so explicitly um i actually do in my because um part of my role involves um a certain degree of engagement with widening participation which is again a very double-edged and mixed thing um, from an institutional point of view but one of the things it has allowed me to do is run the sort of scheme that you're that you're sort of talking about now I actually do this sort of across hum and the idea is every year it got a bit got a bit disrupted by the pandemic but we sort of boxed on on an online format but is to recruit students from across postgraduate and undergraduate and actually get them involved in um, running creative uh, it's sort of broadly creative writing programs in schools and with young people. Again, the, the idea being 
all those creative arts and what have you, they're what are being really squeezed at the moment. And I fear what are going to get squeezed even more. So if you package something as a sort of university engagement activity, you can kind of get away with doing a lot of creative stuff. And I'll tell you that you're you're quite right in your surmise. The effects are extraordinary. I mean, it's a really important program for the UEA students because suddenly they don't feel like babies anymore who we're, are having to jump through kind of elaborate hoops to get, you know, whatever we want from them they suddenly they stand a bit taller they have responsibility they they put so much like, unbelievable amounts of effort into preparing their workshops into preparing resources I then have to come along and say okay leave some space for the young people um so you know they but you know when they're and then when they're actually doing you know the sessions it's the it's such a intense concentration absolute absorption they're much better at it than I am, you know, um, they sort of, they are so natural in the delivery and the interaction, the engagement with the young people. Anyway, this is one particular example, but I think it really illustrates um, what you're saying. And again, so integral to towards making this much larger cultural change where we stop thinking again in this really babyish kind of very what it is Rupert I think is that a real hangover from the kind of public school era you know where it was like a group of sort of very very privileged people who were going to struggle against each other for the top jobs in in society and actually we just don't need that culture it's not going to help us deal with the problems that we've got and what you're describing this you know I think how important would it be just moving the other way if our students at UEA who for the most part are in their late teens early 20s but if they did have a lot more engagement with the kind of community older people people with lots of different sorts of life experience whenever I've had mature students in a class I go thank you that's brilliant because the conversation is going to be richer and more interesting I just don't get enough of them and it's not fair to put them entirely under pressure as a Ah, oh, here we have a representative of life's wisdom. What do you think? You know, you can't do that. So um, I just think, what are we doing that is putting people off, um, older people off that lifelong engagement? Well, that's quite simple. It's really expensive. We don't make it clear we do part time and we don't try and be flexible with how we run our courses. Hopefully some of the online experience that we've all been having may change some of that. Yeah. And and one of the really key points in, in what you were saying there for me is how do people learn well one of the very best ways to learn is by having to try to share what you know um, teach. And, uh, and, and in a genuine way not in a kind of right now you can do a presentation kind of way uh, uh, and you know the more we give uh, you know it's incredible if you look at indigenous cultures or peasant cultures the, the the amazing maturity of uh, of many children who are not even teenagers, whereas we're sort of infantilizing uh, children and young adults uh, right through to the time when they uh, when they graduate. And yeah, what what I've been suggesting and what you've been talking about is a very genuine way of getting around that and getting beyond that and reducing the sense of of uh, competitiveness and peer pressure and peer cohort and so on in the process. Yeah, very good. Okay, over to Jeff Hinchcliffe from the School of Education here at UEA, who has a question about um, the social. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, hi, um, Sophie. Um, uh, nice to hear from you, and um, I enjoyed your lecture. And I, by the way, I, I, I do agree with you about grading, and I think it would be a good idea um, to for first years to have um, a circuit break, to use the term, a circuit break from great, a circuit break from grading. Um, yeah. I agree with you there. But my question really was on, you made some remarks about the idea of the social, and we're all social. And uh, this is a kind of fairly familiar thought, and it's one that um, I've taken for granted, um, you know, ever since I was an undergraduate. We're all social beings, yeah, obvious, in it. But increasingly nowadays, I just wonder, whether it's true. First of all, I don't really know what, what people mean by social. Uh, that seems to be a, a kind of strange mystery concept that we all use, but I'm not quite sure what it means. Secondly, you say, well, how can you be, go beyond the social? But, but you see that there are, there are traditions that, that 
don't really belong to our current sociality. So there are ethical traditions that don't belong. And you mentioned the romantics. Mm. Um, and they're a good example, actually, of, 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 of a bunch of people who thought beyond the social, thought beyond sociality of their own times and invoke different traditions and different ways of seeing um, that are not reducible to the social. So their seminal book, The Lyrical Ballads, um, God, I've just seen that I've got a low battery on my iPad. <laughs> their, their ask a question quick, work, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to be quick. Yeah. <laughs> their seminal work, um, um, Lyrical Ballads, published 1798, that's the book that contains... Um, uh, Coleridge's uh, Run of the Ancient Man Mariner. Uh, that's a book that contains a whole host of poems about different poetical subjects, including mad people, very poor people in poverty, about children. They expanded the notion of, of, of the social by, by thinking beyond it. So my question is, what's so good about the social, given the trajectory of your talk? Mm hmm no, that's a that's a sort of great question. It's a sticky, tricky question, Jeff. Thank you. Um, no, actually, it is. It's actually it's the part of my talk I kind of really, to be honest, laboured over, trying to get sort of across what it was I meant, what it was I actually thought I meant. And then on, so on one level, you know, yeah, it is kind of functioning as a sort of very sort of base level anthropological, sociological, you know, definition of just the fact that we, you know, sort of live in a, well, you know, some politicians would, would deny it, but, you know, some, that we live in social arrangement of society, we interact with people we um language is you know something that we constantly sort of is a, is a social tool a social entity um that we sort of kind of have an economy that sort of ties us together or increasingly tears us apart either way um i suppose i was taking a bit of i was taking more of my cues from that romantic um, tradition that you mentioned so obviously a lot of the ideas as I'm sure you'll have recognized are sort of drawing from that romantic tradition but just being a little bit careful and sort of tweaking and critiquing a bit um, I suppose it is that I, I suppose if, if more more broadly I guess you know I'm borrowing a bit from Dewey too and this idea that social is what I mean by that is just that we are constantly, we are constituted by our interactions and transactions with one another, but with the world. So actually I'm using it incredibly broadly and incredibly flexibly. So I'm not just talking about the given group, our, you know, community empirically where we are and as we stand, our work colleagues, our you know, bank manager. I'm not even talking about our kind of national communities. I'm not even talking about our sort of communities of interest or our interpretive communities that we belong to on slightly more abstract levels. I am literally talking about the fact that, you know, sort of we are constantly sort of uh, interacting and transacting with an external world and that that is how we, you know, it's always in this sort of um sort of flow of relationships that we you know even gain a sense of ourselves. we always do so by judging where we are in a particular given situation um and I'm actually even going further still and expanding my view of the social to a far more kind of global planetary sense so it's I'm not just confining it um to people that we are literally transacting with an entire world um and you know, so in that sense, I really am. When I say full social being, I literally mean it in every sense, almost sort of like just a full participant member of a kind of um, living, breathing planet for as long as that actually is the case. And I think it's that sort of recognition and massive expansion of our sense of the social that that's what it's going to take if we're actually going to start to be able to comprehend what um what sort of lives we need to be living in order to kind of um deal with the impending challenges from climate change res um responsibly and effectively i don't know if that's sort of getting a bit closer for you 
Jeff, in terms of what what how I use the term. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I I do see what you mean uh, a little bit anyway because um, Dewey, you mm. mentioned Dewey, and and he mm. uses this term interconnectedness, mm -hmm. and um and that's what in a way that's what you've been expanding on this idea of interconnectedness, yes. and 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 Dewey thought that that education was a reflection of and a promotion of this interconnectedness, particularly a, a democratic education, as he understood it. I guess, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I don't really want to pursue this because my thoughts are only half-baked, really. But, but I, just, I guess that I just think that there are traditions that we can draw on, mm -hmm. um, aesthetic traditions, ethical traditions, literary poetic traditions, that... Um, uh, that, that enable us to go beyond what is straightforwardly social in the interconnected sense and lead us into a, a different kind of a world, a different, yes, a different world, yeah. um, or, or at least one that's related to this world. But yeah, um, so, so I guess that's really, um, that's really all I want to say. Thank you. And I, I think it's um it's going to be probably quite necessary to do that. So some of um some very interesting thinking on this subject come from um Tim Ingold, for example, who um who has just like you're saying just sort of been exploring this notion of if you know he's he's an anthropologist by original training and he's done a lot of work in sort of the um Samai in fin Finland and Scandinavia, and you know sort of taking some of those notions of um sort of if we kind of i mean if we sort of conceive if we stop conceiving of of sort of sociability in terms of well here is me in my you know bounded being and i'm interacting here with jeff and there's jeff over there and there's sort of a line between us and what tim ingold's tried to experiment with is if we try and think more in terms of just sort of um you know and you I must admit it gets a little bit hippie and and you uh you can you can sort of get some fairly painful interpretive dance routines out of this sort of thing but this idea that you know you kind of get rid of those rigid fixed entities and that kind of mechanical or instrumental sort of notion of the social um you know in that kind of x plus y blah 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 type way and it's the sort of more of this sense of a uh, the flow or exchange between two people and that also then when you come back to this notion of democracy um and this idea that you know democracy actually takes a is, democracy actually takes a lot of maturity you know it takes maturity to kind of try and move beyond this sort of sense that oh, if we all get together and we all have a jolly good discussion and we're all very reasonable about it we'll reach a consensus no, we've got to see democracy as a creative project. We've got to see democracy as something where there's give and take and push and pull and that there's conflict and we can't always resolve it. And actually, it's you know far more mature just to sort of say, all right, well, rather than just squabble about whose position is going to ultimately win, what we're going to do is come together and create a sort of new, you know, it's not necessarily compromise. It's just a, a new sort of created vision of what we want to do or where we want to go or how we want to deal with this particular situation it's a completely sort of different way of conceiving i think it's very alien to the received liberal tradition that we get autonomy in the individual from it's borrowing very heavily from the pragmatists and from people like dewey yeah, um, yeah. but then it's also sort of taking a larger lump from those romantics too and saying, do you know what, they might have been on some onto something with their very heavy stress on the artistic because it's in, in the artistic you get that sense, that really strong sense of creativity and the importance of that in the thinking process and the emotional process. Mm, very good. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Um, next question is from Joe Wells. Joe is sceptical about the abolition of grading proposal. Joe, what do you want to say? Um, hi, um, I don't want to come across, first of all, like I'm disagreeing because I agree with pretty much everything you, you're saying. Um, uh, just as, um, so for context, I'm a, I'm a second year undergraduate um, in philosophy. Do so, I teach you? <laughs> no, I, I'm a second year undergraduate at the University of York. Um, oh, okay, then. Fair yeah, enough. <laughs> sorry. Um, and um, I completely agree when we were, we were all passed through as a cohort when um, the pandemic hit last year. And for me, it was the best thing ever. And it was really exciting because oh, I could 
I could study and engage with these things without any worry about any assessment or any of this. But at the same time, my seminars were mostly empty. Um, and my concern kind of is, um, I think the you're wanting to move away from grading is kind of this concern about credentialism and like, there's also this concern about like why people are doing degrees and it should be about the knowledge, it should be about the subjects, which I completely agree with. But at the same time, I think what I saw a lot in that period and even some somewhat towards now as well, is that the motivating and even just conversations with other undergraduates, the motivating factor for a lot of people is that credentialism mm -hmm. and how embedded that is. And almost like if you took the structure away, no one would even know what they were doing anymore. Like yeah. people's answer to why did you come to university is for the degree. Um, it's not because I love this subject or because I just want to talk to people about this. And I also kind of think this is backed up by a lot of the lecturers I've interacted with, although not all of them, where it's like, let's get back to the course material. Like stop talking about that. Like stop talking about this. Let's get back to the course material. Um, you need to know this. Don't worry about that which is always a very strange thing to hear in a philosophy when you start talking about something else. So yeah, I, I was just wondering what your thoughts on some of those concerns were, but everything else about why grading is a problem, I completely agree with. It's just kind of those concerns there. No, the, well, firstly, Joe, I wish I did teach you because you um, <laughs> you sound great. And if you wanted to come along to one of my seminars and, <laughs> and totally digress, well, you'd be completely welcome. It's what everyone else does. Um, yeah, no, I think actually that's a seriously important point. And I think actually, you know, that that sort of makes me think you, you really sort of hit the nail on the head. So many people go to university not because they particularly want to, but because they feel they have to. And that's actually kind of the worst conditions to sort of go under. You know, it is, you know, it is now presented to people as if you don't do this, you know, your future's over um, and you have to go and you have to get this. And it's sort of what you know it is now again I have to sort of step a careful path because you know in this day and age universities are institutions that need to make money in order to survive so I can't be sort of you know I can't not overlook that practical reality um I think possibly that doesn't really detract from the fact that you know so many young people um yeah but uh, it sounds harsh but they shouldn't go because they don't really want to, you know, they even, you know, either it's sort of, okay, well, this is going to be an extension of school, basically, but there'll be a few more parties, and, you know, I'll be able to kind of, you know, drink a bit more or whatever. Um, and it's sort of, you kind of find yourself sort of thinking, well, is that really what we want from our universities? Because then it's, it's creating this kind of weird very fractured institution whereas I suppose the ideal or the ideal that's kind of enshrined in the sort of traditional notion of the university um, was this idea of this community of scholars essentially that you know people would kind of um, come along for the pure passion and love of, of learning of finding out about different subjects of interacting with people with you know equal sort of levels and degrees of interest in things and now we've got on the one hand a kind of business operational unit which pumps out undergraduates teaches them what they need to go and spits them out the other end and frankly I don't blame students for treating it with that degree of pragmatism because you know if that's what they're encountering they can treat it with that sort of contempt because that's what it deserves. Um, it's just a real pity for people like I think you, Joe, who who want more and who for whom this matters on a more, uh, you know, kind of um, emotional and personal level as much as just on a kind of, you know, get the degree level. Um, but then on the other, we still want to have universities, and the reason I work in one and why, you know, I I want to do that rather than necessarily go anywhere else is because there are still those remnants of those people and that culture where else are you going to to find it I mean I said earlier you know there's rich autodidact tradition um in this country but that's you know and I sort of said okay so maybe it doesn't exist as it used to do in this sort of couple of hundred years ago in the sort of self-help um sort of the spirit of the radicals but you know it's a lively online community it's wonderful 
but online's not for everyone. It's not quite the same. It's it's sort of as we've all been discovering for the past year. Yes, it's got huge advantages, but it's not quite the same. And there is really something about that physical space, about you know, sort of those conversations that you have with people that are so meaningful. So, Joe, I think you make an absolutely excellent point. I think I would take that um, sort of what you're saying is sort of a symptom of exactly the kind of culture that I feel, you know, I would like to see certainly, you know, kind of broken down or broken up far more. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of, it sounds, it's, it sounds harsh, but it took, you know, in some way, it, it took a long, it took time for that culture to be instilled, it would take time to break it apart. And all I can hope is that possibly, you know, sort of later in life, maybe those students feel differently or think differently. It is a very young age to go to university. In some ways, you know, I would actually advocate people take several. Jeff mentioned earlier the idea of a circuit breaker between school and university. Some people do have gap years. I actually would say it's a very good idea. I'm not sure anyone's really in the mood to kind of do that sort of level and intensity of study when they're sort of so young. Mm. But yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. Thank you for raising it. Yeah, um, and I completely agree with most of the stuff you just said, so I have nothing more to say. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Let's take Sylvia Cassini next because Sylvia's question is sort of directly related. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sophie. Thank this is been really, really interesting. Um, my question was about the sort of broader setup of the economy and politics that we live in under a capitalist system, mm. where especially in Europe and, you know, in much of the Western world, two families are required, actually all of the world really, to work to make ends meet. Mm. Doesn't that fuel the system we have now where we outsource education to schools and universities because we as parents genuinely do not have time mm. to, to do many things let alone educate our children and is expecting parents to homeschool as well mm. under such a system realistic no no you're absolutely um right and again so that's why I sort of take what I like to call um sort of my realist approach which may be my sort of overly compromised or overly modest approach but um I sort of do I'm very acutely aware that you know parents perhaps would love to do all this sort of stuff but well first of all how do you go about it and second of all there just aren't enough hours in the day and third of all what energy have you got left I mean I get home after well I don't leave home at the moment but when I finish work I'm pretty brain dead now I only have chickens I don't have children um but it's hard enough dealing with them, frankly. Um, so, yeah, so I suppose I sort of say in some ways, you know, J.S. Mill once said that, you know, in days when it is resistance enough just to bend the knee, you know, kind of, they're not great days, but, you know, in some ways, at some moments, that's possibly the very, very best you can do. So I suppose I feel that it's really important that people kind of look around at their own situations and circumstances and say, well, OK, well, what is realistic? If it's realistic that you're not going to want to sit down and jump into a very deep and involved conversation about some particular book or whatever, you know, um, like I said, sometimes just the sheer fact of you know, sort of listening to a young, to someone who's young, to taking them seriously, to having conversations with them, they, you know, any, no matter how tiny, you know, sort of um, the kind of, I won't say gesture, because it's more than a gesture, it matters an awful lot, actually. But if even if all you, you know, you can really sort of practically and realistically do is just, a, you know, kind of listen to someone talking to you about something they're really keen on, like, my nephew and his flipping soccer internet game <laughs> you know I can sort of half listen to that um yeah but your your point is really important because it's like I think it goes back to what Davide was saying as well sometimes it just feels that it's not just that you're having to work and survive within this system and that's the reality for most of us but this system actually then goes out of its way to make sure that any sort of little space or crevice or crack of joy or peace or relaxation you've made for yourself is 
diminished in, in, you know, sort of as the pressure ramps up and up and up and up. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, not a great answer to your question, but all I can say is I completely empathise with that. And all I would say is, you know, sort of people need to find what kind of can work. I mean, I think, it, you know, and it's like with the sort of with the green politics as well, you know, you can't go in, at, you can't immediately expect people to just completely transform their lives but what you can ask is for people to you know and that is actually a form of taking back power as well too it is actually a form of taking back a tiny bit of power by saying okay what can I do what do I think I could do and I suppose that's all I'd really ask of people to to consider yeah great I'm I'm a great proponent of having at least one meal together as a family that always helps with yeah. conversation and it, it makes and it's lost a lot <laughs> these days it makes such thank a you, difference. Thank you. Super. Next question is from Philip Wilson. Philip. Oh, hello, Philip. Hi, Sophie. I thought it was excellent, and I hope you publish this. Um, I think a lot of teachers would and uh, schools would uh, would love to see it. Um, I used to be a school teacher myself, and um, I noticed that schools were becoming incredibly overmanaged institutions, and that was one reason I wanted to leave secondary education. And of course, I I now think that universities are extremely overmanaged institutions as well. I remember once reading um, an educational textbook which actually spoof quoted Wittgenstein, this is for Rupert, it said, of what we cannot manage, thereof we must be silent. And, um, and again, I had a German colleague who used to ask me job titles and she would laugh. I would say something like assistant deputy head with responsibility for curriculum. And she would find that very, very funny. But, you know, schools are very, you know, managed. And of course, it's the way people um, make their careers by doing management in mm. schools and university as well. You don't, you know, you don't get the money for... Well, you, with certain extent you do, but you can't become um, by a big house if you're going to be just teaching in the classroom all your life. And so people move up this management ladder. So my question really is, uh, what do you see as the role of educational management in, in the future? Do you, you know, is it something that just needs abolishing? Is it something that needs reconfiguring, rethinking, um, devolving? Um, because I think at the moment, uh, it's an you know, it is such a big obstacle to change. Mm. Yes. Oh, my goodness, Philip. Oh, my goodness me. Um, I have to step carefully here. Um, it, I mean, it, it's fascinating, like this sort of managerial class, so many kind of classic soci, I mean, I sort of kind of the writing, Weber saw the writing on the wall of the sort of 19th century, so bureaucracy gone mad. And it's not just the layers upon layers of management, which li literally have this amazing divide and rule effect. Like, I honestly believe that, you know, <laughs> that, you know, sort of like colonizations are live and well and very active. It's a brilliant strategy because you like, just like you're saying, you have so many of these different layers of management, you know, and you, you get sort of lost in this utter maze, this cabalistic sort of list of job titles. And you're sort of, all I want to do is release my marks. You know, you didn't let me actually just mark the things and put them back up. No, I had to first tell you I was marking them, get get permission to mark them, get access to them, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now I just want to release them. Who do I need to kill? You know, um, it's, so it's not just the practical structural thing of the fact that half the time, and again, it drains your energy because you just, after a while, you're like, oh, my God, this is going to go. Anytime I want to do a project, unless I kind of just, my technique is to just do it because I figure it's quicker to say sorry than please may I. So that's one technique. Um, it doesn't always work. But so not only have you, does, does it really drain your energy chronically just trying to get all the right people to say yes at the same time. It's the culture that it produces too because it's very sort of, it's very myopic. It's very instrumental. It kind of only does sort of, one thing at a time it has its policies and its frameworks it, it's not so much with the you know I think you know kind of I think looking ahead to next week's talk it's not so much with the flexible adaption or the malleability it's you know kind of it's a sort of very blunt instrument more often again because it cultivates that it really does embed that stratification culture so everyone has their little bit of power their little bit of patch that they can sort of um lord over so the whole thing is just utterly, utterly toxic. It's very interesting you say that, you know, this culture's 
dramatically increased in schools certainly i mean even we've seen it in the past few years you know the more and more and more administrative roles and very interestingly not just this swelling professional staff but actually trying to sort of transfer increasingly academics into quasi managerial positions and posts and officer roles for this that and the other um what do we do about it? Well, so I, like I said, I mean, you know, I half joke, but, you know, in some ways, sometimes, you know, it's just um, literally a case of forging ahead or, you know, I mean, sort of as Davide was mentioning earlier, some of the, you, you are literally being reduced to kind of like, well, we don't need permission just to meet in a cafe and talk about a book you know, so long as we don't, you know, we don't need ethics clearance for that, so long as we don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, so there is a degree to which you're just being constantly pushed back and back and back in terms of the sort of free spaces that you can carve out for yourself. Um, in some ways, it's worrying because in some ways it is like, you know, it is a kind of petrification process. It's going to turn us all to stone sort of eventually, and that is my fear. But I suppose in my kind of resistant spirit, I just sort of think, all right, so I have had to get, you know, my my courses signed off, approved, checked, you know, all that kind of thing. But what happens in that seminar? Those conversations that, you know, sort of a bit like what Joe was saying, you know, I still have some power I can take there. So if someone's saying something really interesting, it's not technically what I've got down that I needed to cover today. I can still make that choice to let it go. Um, and so, yeah, again, it's the same answer. It's like um, the odds are huge. The structures are like horrifying. I mean, I'm sure like I think Rupert could say something here about, you know, because it's the same things that, you know, the green movements up against you know structures which just seem completely monstrously swollen and overbearing and yet I still think there is something quite satisfying about and certainly creative about finding the ways you can sort of slightly defy them <laughs> even if sometimes they're petty <laughs> Yeah, that's, a, that's a great answer. I mean, you talked, I mean, David was talking about de-schooling society and you were talking about going to the coffee shop. I mean, it seems to me that Ivan <laughs> Willick is alive and well in your talk tonight. Sorry, did you say Anarchy is alive and well? Illich. Um, Illich, Illich. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, well, he's kind of, yeah. Well, he is, is an he, anarchist. He's your driving force to your the way you're thinking. I think I would, you know, of, yeah. Um, I, I have great admiration for the schooling society but again what I sort of always say is there's no one method or that because you know anything can become a tyranny with the wrong spirit leading it um so even like and that was kind of the problem with Russo right so Emil you know full of lovely ideas but he's got a very fixed idea and if you as a child you know aren't being quite the child that he had in mind you're in trouble um now i love illich's notion of you know these kind of free range education where you kind of roam around the world and just sort of popping in and to some extent actually the kind of sort of bone structure of this semi exists so we do now have you know there's not a museum or an art gallery or you know a cultural institution that doesn't have some sort of educational facility and actually quite a few of them are free um, or you know fairly easy to access libraries do incredible things now they all have their kind of educational programs so I mean, weirdly enough in a kind of odd way we are more able to kind of realize what Illich was saying than we were when he wrote it but at the same time all this other kind of crap has come to and perhaps you know a bit like the conversation I had with Sylvia you know a lot of people too exhausted to go sort of you know eagerly rooting around um and making the most of all these hidden gems that are all over the place but so yeah my, my big thing is there's no one structure there's no one magic answer um it's just that constant spirit of well where can we find ourselves a bit of autonomy we have to make it somewhere thanks very much sophie thank no you worries. so um look i i'm uh, completely with you all uh, in being against managerialism totally and I think John Simmons's comment in the chat is is very very well taken here 
But can I inject a little note of, uh, of, of realism uh, in a very, very practical way? And possibly make a few of us feel a little bit uncomfortable. Isn't the isn't the brutal reality that actually uh, managers and administrators at universities nowadays do lots of things that uh, that staff that academic staff are not very willing to do? Um, so you look, for example, at the way that academic staff used to spend quite a lot of time on university governance. Mm. Uh, and academic staff have complained about having university governance taken away from them. And, and you know, I've tried to resist that, that process uh, here at UEA. But actually, at the end of the day, aren't a lot of academic staff really mm. quite happy about it? Because the, the bottom line is that what most academic staff want to do is they want to maximise their time uh, teaching and researching and spending time with their uh, family or at the beach or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and if I look over my career, which has been quite a while now in, in higher education, actually, um, yeah, sure, there have been some forms of management which have become more intrusive, but actually I probably spend less time uh, having to do admin or other things that I don't want to do than I did uh, when I first uh, arrived at UEA, let alone before I was at UEA. So do we need to be a little bit uh, careful here? Yeah. Is there a risk of a, a sort of hypocrisy? Is there a risk that we're, we're going around saying how terrible managerialism is, but actually we collude with it because it suits us quite well uh, as academics? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Sophie? Uh, yeah. Anyone else who's here? Yeah. Great point. Um, I, like you, Rupert, not want to lie to little administrators. Um, frankly, I don't think there's ever been a form that I uh, have actually managed to fill out correctly the first time. I think I would make a distinction here between managerialism as a culture and managerialism as a, managerialism as a sort of overbearing structure and actually managing an administration as actually quite a, as a, quite a sort of um, considerable skill and a talent. I actually think that, you know, the form that it's currently in now with this constant sort of gargantuan ever, you know, kind of, it, <laughs> sort of, sort of evolving beast or monstrosity of extra layers and extra titles and what one person used to do, you know, kind of holistically as part of like, you know, the sort of, uh, sort of maybe a bit of a quaint notion, but the school you know, back when school secretaries actually had sort of a kind of proper jurisdiction, a proper kind of, you know, role and a presence in the school rather than at the moment, that role is kind of there's a bit that's split out to the hub or there's a bit that's split out somewhere else. And, you know, that's splitting, that constant division. So it's actually sort of devaluing and de-skilling really good, talented administrators um, who can you know, so and it is, again, that division of labor, that breaking down. You only do one bit of the process. Therefore, you never really understand the whole. Therefore, you never really care about the whole. And therefore, you never really sort of get inspired by what you're doing. because You don't have to employ any creativity yourself. Academics, you know, I sort of think I, I would definitely not definitely not saying I would like to do more admin. Absolutely not. No. Um, and I don't think any of our colleagues would be. Well, maybe some of them. But um would be particularly keen on that I suppose again I'm sort of saying I see something a bit if I'm honest kind of um sinister about um the sort of the sprawl of managerialism I don't necessarily see that you know I see a huge and tremendous value in gifted and talented kind of professional people um who are actually given the dignity of their craft because it is a craft just like ours is a craft to us you know but um just having this ever sprawling professional structure which actually doesn't even kind of speak within itself there's no sort of feedback loops within that system let alone coming out of it um that is i suppose what i am mostly objecting to yeah and that makes sense. Thank you. Folks, we're coming to the toward the end here. As a final question, I want to take this question that Daryl asked in the chat, because it does seem a nice one to end with. So Daryl said, in conclusion, will the COVID period help change education for the better? Or will lessons learned be ignored 
which I think really means unlearned. Uh, Sophie, do you, do you have a, a, a sense of what the chances are that we will come out of this uh, COVID crisis uh, taking on board any of the things you've been saying here <laughs> this evening? Do you feel any sense of, uh, of, uh, of optimism, at least optimism of the will, perhaps? Mm. Okay, well, I must admit, you know, obviously, we the first thing we hear, you know, before the children even re went back to school was government putting pressure on for summer schools. Um, this is a horrible idea, frankly. Um, it is not, it's got nothing to do with children's well-being. It's got nothing to do with children's learning. Um, it's a very thoughtless and, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with how teachers might be feeling as well because obviously this is you know kind of um a huge pressure on on you know everyone involved in education um if i again in that realist spirit that i've been channeling all evening um i have got a horrible feeling that the things like that will just you know sort of surge ahead masquerading under the kind of claim that this is going to be for the benefit of children other than maybe a bit of free childcare in the summer. I don't really see how it's going to benefit anybody. I suppose my hopes are actually more granular that, you know, that a few parents might now realise, oh, it's quite cool to talk to my children about different things or, you know, kind of, um, or, you know, that that becomes a bit more of established culture in many households or, you know, parents even just become a bit more kind of, well, what exactly are you being asked to do at school? Just a little bit more vigilance there, just a little bit more awareness might lead to a little bit more questioning. In terms of sort of university, I do hope that we take some of the kind of, I think some of the, again, the unexpected insights from the kind of process we've all had to be through, like the fact that we just had to kind of be a bit more flexible um, in our approaches and box on despite, you know, techno gremlins and crazy setups with our teaching. And maybe that sort of dropped some of the barriers. It certainly has with me and my students as they're sort of um, watching me sort of desperately <laughs> sort of try and struggle along with an online lecture. It certainly does kind of demystify things somewhat. Um, and I think also it will be very interesting to see, you know, whether there's anything we can take away from what happened with the first years last year and whether actually there, we could actually pursue that as a sort of tangible case that maybe first years don't need you know, heavy grading and they do need that kind of pause between what they've just been through at school and that ease into university. Is that a positive thing we can take forward? Mm, don't know. Um, so, yeah. I sort of feel that there are insights to be had and that actually is, you know, possibly an advance on where we were, which is just, you know, this kind of blanket sense of this has been terrible and awful and we're lucky to have made it through, well, touch wood, um, we're lucky to have made it through the other side. No, actually, you know, there are, if you really want to look, <laughs> you know, there are still some, I mean, some families have had some really quite important moments and time spent together forced but there's still something valuable and precious about that um so i think you know uh in answer it will be mixed um but if we can take something we as individuals can take just something even something small away from this then i think that's something to hold on to yeah that sounds right Sophie, thank you so much. This has been a really super uh, evening. Uh, the, the comments in the chat and and, and uh, orally, uh, verbally have been, you know, really, really strongly positive. It's been a great discussion. Um, we may, just to anticipate uh, folks, that we may sort of follow this up next year with some similarly themed uh, events in the whole series of, of public lectures in philosophy. So that's something to, to potentially uh, look forward to. Um, for this evening, I just want to say, uh, do look at the messages recently in the chat, including the, the video links. Do take those away, folks. Do cut and paste those. Uh, and what's just gone up in the, in the chat is the information about the final event in our series in a fortnight's time. So as I mentioned at the start, that's me and a couple of UEA colleagues. Can we adapt transformatively to climate decline? Can we make something positive out of the terrible climate situation uh, that we're in and that's going to be continuing for the foreseeable future. So it really couldn't be much more of an important topic there. Hope that lots of you will come to this. Hope lots of you will tell other people uh, about this evening. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, our administrators and our technical uh, team, uh, as always. 
Uh, and I'm now going to invite everyone to unmute themselves so that we can thank Sophie in the usual way. <laughs> You're muting, folks. Yeah, here we come. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you all next time.